Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about uh, a rare plant from Nevada. And Jennifer, I am extremely jealous of your plant's ability to let you make puns. This story does not have that ability, but I wish I had it. Okay, for today's talk, I am going to uh, talk about why Teams Buckmeat Teams Buckwheat was in the news and apologies for any stumbling over words. I have braces and it's it's just a wreck. But anyhow, I uh, will talk about Teams Buckwheat. We'll talk about environmental DNA and how we could use that to provide evidence of rodent herbivory. And then we'll talk about other evidence that might support this herbivory hypothesis. These are just some photos of the site in Nevada. Now to orient you, you can see down in the lower left of the screen, there's a map of Nevada. This plant is found only in Nevada, as far as we know, uh, between Dyer and Tonopah, so in this western side of the state. If we zoom in to that area, what we can see there is that the team's buckwheat populations are within this big black outline that you can see. Um, and within that black outline, which is a proposed drilling site for lithium, are these little orange blobs. And the little orange blobs are the different subpopulations of Teams buckwheat that have been mapped to date. So what you can see is it's not a very big area. This is a pretty rare plant. And it's right smack dab in where they want to drill for this lithium. So you can see the little dotted line down there and all those little black dots on the map. Those are where they've done some exploratory drilling. This is a Ioneer mining company and the extent that they think so far of the lithium that's quite valuable is outlined by that little dotted line. Okay, so a little background on Teams Buckwheat. This is clearly a rare plant and they, people think that there's about 45,000 individuals. Fish and Wildlife Service is working on this plant and some biologists at the University of Nevada, Reno are also working on the plant's biology. Uh, it's concentrated on this 21 acre area so far, and it is under consideration for listing under the Endangered Species Act. It lives on these boron lithium rich soils, which is why the mining company is so interested in this particular plant. And those soils in that one location have an after tax value of over $1.2 billion because of its connection, lithium, to the renewable energy industry. Uh, vehicles supported that are electric vehicles, right, would use lithium batteries. And this puts a lot of money on the table. The mining company uh, was accused of orchestrating an attack on the plants in part because they put up this poster that you can see on the right. So it says missing teams buckwheat and they were offering a $5,000 reward to anyone who located new populations of the plant. And so on the one hand, the mining company said that, well, we wanna find more populations of the plant because then of course they could build their mine. It's an open pit mine that they're proposing. Um, but of course, if you have more populations of the plant, it's probably growing on lithium, which means there's more lithium to be found. And this particular poster was viewed by some groups as not, we want to find more lithium, we want to find more plants, but we want you to go out and kill plants, even though they, they did specify, do not collect the plants if you find them. Um, so did humans poach the, the buckwheat plants? Um, people, the initial reports when they found the damage, the, the, it was accusations that humans came in, they must have done this. It was so many plants. Look at all these little holes. Someone must have come in with a shovel. Every single red circle you can see on this photo in the, the presentation is where a plant was dug up and a little hole remained. Um, approximately 27,000 plants were damaged. And recall that we're only talking about a population world total of uh, in the 40,000s of plants. So 27,000 plants were damaged. No one was there. This is a pretty isolated uh, location, but this damage occurred sometime between July and September of 2020. Okay, so what evidence did we have to support this human poaching hypothesis? Um, some evidence that was put out there was 
we saw new footprints and new trails. But this area had been getting a lot of coverage in the press because of this conflict between um, the mining company, green industries, and the rarity of the species. So lots of people were starting to come out and look at the plant. The scale of the damage was just enormous, right? It was a lot of plants that were damaged. So this was construed to be humans must have done it. Um, the, there were some quotes and most of the quotes said, the damage appears to have been you know, done by humans. Um, again, appears to have been dug up by small shovels or spades. And you know, really well-credentialed experts also said, I've never seen anything like this. Um, all these quotes are attributed to the people who said them in the newspaper stories. But you have lots of experts coming in saying that we've never seen anything like this before. Um, it doesn't seem to be a natural thing, so it must have been humans. Okay, on the other hand, uh, could it have been rodents eating this team's buckwheat? So some evidence that might support that rodent herbivory hypothesis is just the, the damage or the condition of the plants themselves. But if you look at this close up on the left here of what a damaged root looked like, you can see it's, it's evenly stripped all the way down the front of the root. Um, if you look even closer to this picture on the right, you can actually see individual tooth marks from where a rodent has chewed on this particular plant. So this rodent herbivory hypothesis was supported by chew marks by soil tailings. So if we look again at that photo on the left, you can see all that loose soil down there. When a rodent digs a hole, right, we've all seen this, it leaves uh, loose dirt in the area, so soil tailings. Uh, there were also camera trap images of rodents roaming around, uh, wood rats in Neotoma, uh, kangaroo rats, and um, oh, pocket gophers as well. And there were pocket gopher burrows at the site. So the Fish and Wildlife Service called me and asked me if we could use a genetic technique to explore and pin down if a rodent had been involved in this whole process. So DNA metabarcoding is this technique that uh, geneticists use to identify environmental DNA. So eDNA is environmental DNA. And the way that we do this is we extract our sample from the environment. It can be a bit of soil, it can be some water. Uh, and in this case, it was bits of roots and plant material. We can extract the DNA from that environmental sample. And then if we're only interested in a single species, say we knew for sure it was a pocket gopher, then we would just target pocket gopher DNA and we would amplify that DNA and use it to identify whether pocket gophers had been involved. But in this case, we didn't really know. So we used a technique called DNA metabarcoding, which means that we use a more general primer, which is a, a thing that helps us identify locations on DNA. And we ident tried to amplify or copy all the different types of DNA in our samples. And then we could get a look at the whole community of organisms that, was, that were interacting, was interacting um, with these samples. We used two specific markers, 12S, which is good for vertebrates, and TRNL, which is good for plants. We looked at several different types of samples, chewed roots, soil tailings, and we were lucky enough to actually find scat within some of the soil tailings at the site. Okay, so again, here's that close up of your damaged roots. We took multiple samples of damaged roots, approximately 30 different plants, pooled them together and extracted the DNA left by that drooling little devil uh, as they chewed the plant. So that environmental DNA was left by the rodent on these chew marks. The width of this incisor pattern here corresponds to a couple different species antelope ground squirrels and kangaroo rats both have about this size of incisor. And again, that environmental DNA is any trace DNA left in the environment. Uh, by comparison, you can see some control roots here from some buckwheats that were located in the population that's destined for digging up from the mine. So the, the agency let us take these samples. We took uh, 12 different plants and took them right down to the root. And you can see this looks much different than the plants that were eaten by rodents. Okay, we also took control soil. So up here in your left-hand corner, you can see the red arrow and it shows you what control soil looks like at this site. Lots of rocks, not very much of the loose soil itself. 
If we, we scan over to the right, you can see soil tailings shown by this pink arrow, and they are very loose. You can see lots of soil has been dug up, um, perhaps by rodent, perhaps by a human, we'll find out. And you can see uh, towards the center, little bits of team's buckwheat that's been scattered and kicked about by the perpetrator, we'll say. Okay, so at this point, I collected the samples with the help of partners from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the BLM, and we shipped them off to a sequencing company called Jonah Ventures in Boulder, Colorado. And they shipped me back all the sequence data. I used something called the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, or BLAST, and geneticists will say we blasted the data, and that just means we take it and we put it into the database and we see what kinds of matches come from that database. Um, just for those of you who are into genetics, we set the E value to one to the minus 50th, which is a measure um, of the chance that the matches that we're finding were there by accident. So in this case, we're saying that there's a one in 10 to the minus 50th probability that the two sequences are matching on accident. And then uh, the searches for vertebrates and plants were optimized. There's a little button you click and blast that says optimize for highly similar sequences. Um, again, this E value is that number of hits that we expect to see by chance. And the closer your number is to zero, the better. And 0.0, .0 is the absolute best score you can get. All right, so let's look at some data. Um, what we see here is that those squirrel DNA barcodes were present in damaged um, root samples and disturbed soil samples. But first we'll start out with what kind of DNA did we find? We found in gray, no match. We just couldn't find a match, any DNA sequence in the database that matched the DNA we have. That's not surprising. There are lots of species on the earth and not all of them have been sequenced yet. Um, so we only found three sequences and you can see them in gray here, they didn't match. Human sequences, lots of people were coming out, touching the plants, putting them back on the ground. Um, I know that I and my crew touch plants and put them back on the ground. We're not surprised to have found some human DNA, two sequences in the, the data pool. Um, we also found some bacteria and fungal sequences, but those sequences were quite poorly matched. They, the markers that we used were not optimized for bacteria and fungi, so it's not surprising that the match was not that great. Um, blue for squirrel and light pink for the deer. So if we look at the actual data here, we can see deer DNA was found in the control roots, it was found in damaged roots, and it was found in disturbed soil. So what that's telling me at least is that there are a lot of uh, deer in the area. And if a, a deer urinates, that urine can spray DNA all over your site. So it's not surprising that we're finding deer DNA in many different parts of our sampling. Um, bacterial and fungal DNA primarily found in control soil and a little bit in damaged roots, a little bit in disturbed soil. And then finally, in blue, what you see there is we only find that squirrel DNA um, in the disturbed soil and in the damaged roots. That squirrel DNA itself uh, matches DNA sequences from Amelspermophilus, which is uh, the antelope ground squirrel group. And again, that E value was set to one to the minus 50. And there is a PID, percent identity match, between 97 and 100%. But PID is not a super reliable source. So we usually just stick with the E value. OK, then we looked at the scat. And we were able to see that there was squirrel DNA in the scat. And that squirrel DNA, again, matched the antelope ground squirrel group with those same uh, parameters of stringency. And we also found plants DNA in the pink family, the goosefoot family, so Caryophyllaceae, Chenopodiaceae, um, Polygonaceae. So our buckwheat family, we found really good matches for DNA. Uh, Team's buckwheat is not in this system yet. Um, but the closest match that we found was Ariagonum crosbii. Uh, we also found some globe mallow or mallow family DNA and some grass DNA. So all what you would expect to find in a ground squirrel's, uh, antelope ground squirrel's diet. Okay, so now what other evidence might we have to support this herbivory hypothesis? I've been working with a group of now uh, almost 40 different 
observers throughout this Intermountain Southwest region. And we have been documenting observations of rodent damage throughout the area and really severe levels of rodent damage through this season of 2000, or February of 2020 all the way through uh, March of 2021. And we can see over on the left-hand side of your map there, Teams Buckwheat is this far northern western point. And then we have many other different species, but it um, spans all the way over to, you know, between Phoenix and the Mesa area over here, south down to San Diego and north, just a little bit into Utah. Um, I've done some surveys over here and found that rodents are really hitting buckwheats really, really hard. So there are about 39 different species that have been documented to have had or sustained really um, impressive amounts of rodent damage during this year, which we think is correlated to the massive drought conditions that are spanning across this whole region. So what I would like to conclude with is that, yeah, rodents are a problem. Um, I think this evidence for rodents being part of the team's buckwheat destruction is really strong. It's circumstantial, but quite convincing. Again, if we look at this really nice mother plant here of a team's buckwheat, you can see these little rodent side patch, rodent sized patches where the rodent dug all the loose soil up above here. If I were a human, I would go for this big one if I wanted to destroy it and just wipe it out. But if I were a rodent, I would dig in to what I needed and then abandon the plant if I couldn't get down to the tap root. Um, Jim Boone is a naturalist in the area who has this really interesting account that shows lots of pictures of the other species that have been affected by rodents this year. And overall, there seems to be a lack of systematic collection of evidence to support this human poaching hypothesis, which doesn't mean that humans weren't involved. It just means that there are other data that maybe should be collected, like the size of the holes, the type of the holes. Do we have footprints leading to every single plant that was disturbed? You know, that kind of evidence. Um, and I'd like to end with, we should probably move our focus from who's to blame for this and to more to conserving rare plants because not only have we documented severe rodent damage on Teams Buckwheat this year, we've also seen it um, through Susan Meyer's group and she might talk about this later on Astragalus ampullarioides, which is the Shivwitz, muck, uh, Shivwitz milk vetch on Arctomecan humilis, which is the dwarf bear claw poppy. And another one, Cylindra puntia munzii, munzis choya, um, down by the border has had some really severe damage this year. So it, we really would be um, good to start putting our efforts into figuring out why we're seeing all this damage from rodents, what we can do about it. And it's not surprising to see that a lot of damage is coming to these rare plants because oftentimes in their habitats, they are the main plant in that habitat because it's usually a difficult habitat for other plants to live in. So with that, I'd like to thank all the folks who came out and helped me with field work. And for the people who are contributing to herbivory observations, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Land Management who paid for the sequencing, I volunteered all my time on this analysis. And Joan Ventures is a great partner. I really like working with them and my university is also very supportive. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or save them for later if we need to and um, send your rodent, rodent herbivory or observations or upload them to iNaturalist if you can, that would be great. Thanks.